In the world of mixed martial arts, Nick Diaz is a guy that has a sort of mind control over the fan base. Whether you like him, hate him, or feel indifferent towards him, whenever his name pops up in the news in any capacity, you just can't help but look. When it comes to fighting, most would call him a legend, some would call him overrated, but you would be hard pressed to find a person that would call him not interesting. Over the years, he's managed to build up a devoted fan base of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, and he did it all by being as publicly anti-social as he possibly could. It's a Paradox. The more he did to limit his exposure to the fans, the more infatuated with him the fan base became. And because there's such a demand for all things Nick Diaz out there, I set out to make this video the most well-researched and deepest Nick Diaz video out there. And I don't know if I succeeded in doing that, but I do know that I uncovered some things that most average fans aren't aware of. The other thing I wanted to do is to make this video from the perspective of a fan, but not a fanboy. A lot of the videos about him out there treat him more like a man crush than the subject of a documentary. Ooh, ooh, my sad Stockton waifu. I don't want to tell a story from that angle. It just wouldn't feel right. So when you see me discuss things that could be deemed touchy or discuss things in a way that don't completely take Nick's side, just try to keep in mind that I don't dislike Nick Diaz. In fact, I'm a huge fan, but I'm just trying to keep it fair. So with that said, and without further ado, let's get into it. Nicholas Robert Diaz was born in Stockton, California on August 2nd of 1983 to Robert Diaz and Melissa Womble. He is of Mexican and English descent and the oldest of three kids, followed by younger brother Nathan and the youngest sister Nina. Stockton as a city is no joke. It's one of the most violent places in California and statistically speaking, its violent crime rate is more than twice the national average. According to GangMentality.com, the city houses close to 70 documented gangs with 30 of them being currently active. And in 2012, it was named the most miserable city to live in by Forbes magazine. For an example of the types of things that go down in Stockton in 2014, the city made headlines when a bank robbery resulted in over a thousand rounds being exchanged between the police department and the robbers. When the smoke cleared, two suspects and a hostage were deceased and two additional hostages were injured. Naturally, growing up in a place like that was tough and Nick would often get into squabbles around his neighborhood, sometimes by himself and sometimes with a group of his friends. But it wasn't all bad and he wasn't just an unsupervised street kid he did have a positive role model in his father who got him into exercising early, something that would obviously pay dividends later on. Man, I've been you... running and I've been swimming since I was four years old. My dad took me jogging two miles. He liked to run two miles. He jump rope and lift weights in the garage, a, a broke ass garage. But there was uh, some weights and a jump rope and he'd take me out on a two mile run. So I know how to run two miles. And there's the thing at Mickey Grove Zoo called the, the bunny run on Easter. <laughs> And I used to do the bunny run. And, uh, you know, I got, I, I got competitive swimming because, not because I wanted to be a swimmer, not because I wanted to swim, but because there was a guy on the block next to me that was about to beat me and then feel good about it. And I was not <laughs> having that. So I would swim fast. And if I look over in my lane and I could see somebody next to me, I'm swimming. my times were better. So I was, of course I was competitive. And his grandfather, Don Womble, was a track coach at Lodi High School and will work with him as well. In fact, Don Womble is a Lodi legend. When he passed away in 2010, over 100 athletes and alumni gathered his memorial. The following year, the football and track field at Lodi High School was renamed the Don Womble Field in his memory. And that same year, a booster event, a race named the Womble Rumble was created for the Lodi Track and Field Program and the Lodi Track Club. It's been going on annually since 2011 and has been able to generate over $1 million. When he was in elementary school, Nick was deemed to be hyperactive and put on Ritalin, an experience that he would later liken to being on methamphetamines, and would even credit it with not trying harder drugs as he became a teenager. Basically, if you didn't have good attendance, you got moved around to school and your parents didn't give a shit. They're like, here, put this kid on drugs. So, And that's right. another thing too, is like, you know what, people don't realize it. Like I was talking to this these foreigners the other day and I was like, yeah, you know, like, uh, I don't remember how we got into the conversation, but like, you know, half the kids on in school are on drugs. Half the kids yeah. on school are on methamphetamines and nobody knows about it. It's not a big deal. It's like, oh, it's pharmaceutical. Right, Adderall yeah, and all that. It's uh, not funny, man. It's like, are you bands. kidding me? So that's why I never like got into, I could, I, I, who knows? I might be a dope head, right? Like, but by the time, I mean, they shoved so much meth down my throat in second grade that by the time I got, you know, older and, and people were starting to, you know, smoke crank and do all that. I'm like, this is basically some strong ass Ritalin. I don't want none of that. Around the same age, he also met a person that would end up becoming his best friend and influencing his taste in music and his style. Something that again would carry over into his adult years. I'm more of an old school 80s rocker type of guy at the time. Yeah. I listened to rock music. My friend didn't like rap music and he was kind of like my older brother type of guy, you know. You know, we were listening to rock and getting stoned and, and you know, I learned a lot about a lot. I dressed to 
overly gangster. I looked kind of hood, you know. Yeah. I, but I was more of a kind of a skater. I wanted to. My brother never skateboarded. I can skateboard. I can actually skateboard. I wanted to skateboard so bad. Like when I was in sixth grade, I got a skateboard for Christmas. You know, this is right when they started making boards with like the both sides. So yeah. I came in. I was already trying to skateboard when it was like the old school boards, and so I was really into it. And I just like the whole, you know, being like, uh, you know, kind of just being a skater. I lived in Stockton. There was nobody. You're not going to find anybody to hang out and go skate. They didn't have skate parks. I would go and try to like rent a video on like maybe how to skateboard or how to do yeah. tricks or something. There was nothing. There was no instruction on how to skateboard. There was no older brothers to learn from. And, you know, I was all about that life until... Uh, until uh, I realized that there's nobody skateboards except for me. This friend also had a younger sister named Stephanie who he would bar Nick from trying to date, but despite that, Nick had a huge crush on her. Going into his early teenage years, Nick would continue getting into fights around his neighborhood and he wouldn't always come out on top, which led him to searching for ways to better defend himself. Being inspired by a combination of 80s and early 90s Jean-Claude Van Damme movies and Hoyce Gracie winning UFC 1, he began to search for a local gym that taught martial arts. And soon stumbled onto Animal House where he trained alongside MMA fighter Steve Heath who would go on to fight Chuck Liddell. He would also have a brief stint at Shamrock 2000, an offshoot off of Ken Shamrock's The Lion's Den ran by his adoptive father Bob Shamrock. I was a Lion's Den fighter as far as, well at least I thought that's what I had walked into. Was a, It said Shamrock 2000, I thought it could have been Lion's Den, it could have fooled me. I walked in there and met Bob Shamrock and a bunch of shit. I used to train with Frank, all had the same sort of style. He also picked up the habit of smoking weed, which he initially hid from the people he trained with. When I'd come in, I didn't want no one to know I was lit, but I wasn't about to go in some hour appointment of any type or workout or anything without like, you know, smoking a little weed first. So, but when I would, I was lit and I didn't want to talk to nobody. And I was like, they're going to know I'm high. So I would start working out like crazy. Like, okay, we're in a gym. What do you do here? Work out. Well, that's what I'm doing. I got, I would get right to it and I would jam out. And I would be in a hurry to break a sweat and get into a workout so that I'm not high anymore. But I'd still be high, but just not I mean, a comfortable high. I'm right. just stoned and sitting there like, oh, f like everyone's looking at me or something. They're like, yeah. go ahead, look at me, I'm working out. So that's what I would do. I would, yeah. And then they're like, damn, this kid's a machine. <laughs> Nick soon found out that Steve Heath was a blue belt under Caesar Gracie Jiu Jitsu. And hearing the name Gracie, he immediately associated it with Hoist and became excited and decided to go straight to Caesar Gracie's academy. And from that point on, that would become his permanent gym, convincing his mom to take hour long drives to take him there. Becoming proficient in Jiu Jitsu made Nick more and more confident in his abilities to handle himself in a fight. But competing in Jiu Jitsu also exposed him to people that were even better fighters than him, and that kept his desire to improve going. There's a pretty amusing story of Nick taking a girl that he liked from the gym to the fights and freezing up when Rampage Jackson wanted to talk to her. I'm with this girl in line ordering some food. They all come in behind us, right? And he goes, yo, man, yo, yo, is that your girl? That's your girl? I'm 16, 17. I'm like, no. I mean, she's my friend. And, <laughs> and no. he goes, so he's, oh, okay, all right, all right. He's, yo, girl, yo, girl, yo, girl. And she's like, what, what? And he, he's like, yo, girl, yo, girl. He's like, what's your style? What's your style? <laughs> and she's like, what? What are, you talking, what are you talking about? And he's like, oh, doggy style, doggy style. <laughs> what? I was like, oh, my God. And she just, doggy style? She's, yeah, yeah. He's like, oh, doggy style, doggy style. Doggy. And I was like, what? They all hyphy on her, right? And I'm just like, oh, man. I can't say anything. I'm looking at this giant Rampage character, and I'm like, yeah, so I don't say nothing. And then we were leaving this place. She's like, what the? You didn't even say anything. And I'm oh, like, oh, no. my God. I'm like, what did you want me to say? No. What did you want me to say to this guy? The two would actually parody the incident down the line. Nick, I've never, I've never done this for you. Nick, I've, Nick, I've never done this for you. Is this out of order, brother? Yeah. And through all this, Nick still kept his crush on his best friend's sister, and going into Toke High School in Lodi, California, his friend finally eased up on the two of them dating. But dating her created a whole new set of problems for Nick. Her ex-boyfriend was the mascot on the Toke High School football team. And apparently the football players in Toke High were gang affiliated, and a lot of them were also on meth. Which is weird, let's face it, uh, but that's what it was. Nick would constantly get into fights with these guys, which would lead to suspension and eventually being placed into a continuation program and then dropping out altogether. This period of his life also exacerbated his anxiety issues with him going into school every single day not knowing whether or not he'd be getting jumped or maybe even stabbed and probably contributed greatly to this sort of reserved personality that we see from him later on in life. Nick would continue seeing Stephanie as she lived in a trailer park that was close to his grandparents house but unfortunately she proved to be troubled in her own right. She attempted to 
attempted to take her own life several times and the two would end up breaking up with Stephanie ending up dating Nick's friend Bart. The love triangle between Nick, Bart, and Stephanie would continue until unfortunately on July 5th of the year 2000, Stephanie ended up taking her own life by walking in front of a car. The local newspaper wrote that Stephanie was emotional and inebriated coming from an argument with a family member. A witness claimed to have seen her walk in the center lane with no attempt to move. She was only 16 years old. Here's how Nick described the night it happened. Before I ever had my first pro fight July 5th of 2000, Bart had a party at his house. The night before, Stephanie had told me she loved me. After the party, I was gonna go back to her house with her brother. He was my best friend, but some friends weren't doing well and headed to my house, so I had to go. An hour later, I got a call from her mom saying, are you with Stephanie? She came straight to my house to get me, took me up and down the Fonders Road on Highway 99 by my grandma's house next to her trailer park. There was a wreck on the freeway. I jumped the fence and saw only one car and ambulances. She had walked and herself on the freeway. The girl I loved more than anything had tried to for the third time and succeeded. She was going to go to college. She was an avid student and was doing everything I couldn't while living in the trailer park where everyone was doing dope. Meanwhile, I focused my whole high school years worried about what her and her friends would think if I lost a fight to her ex-boyfriend and football friends. I could never make attendance, hung out with the wrong people to hold my ground as a fighter and someone who I would fight for was important to me. There was no way I was going to go to school. I had no money, no car. I would have driven there and stopped her. After that, I was grown up. It was all over. I wasn't a kid anymore. Nick would continue running seven miles to her grave just to tell her that he would make it as a fighter just like he promised her that he would. But before he had a chance to have his first fight, he was stabbed on New Year's of 2001. Not a lot of details exist regarding this incident except for this Instagram post here. Nick made his debut on August 31st of 2001 at IFC Warriors Challenge 15 against Mike Wick, winning by triangle choke in round one. In his second fight against Chris Lytle, he would fill in for Jake Shields, who had to pull out due to injury, something that would lead to a lifelong friendship with Jake. His next three fights would all be fought in one night. Nick will win the first two and then proceed to lose by a pretty brutal TKO in the first round in his third fight against Jeremy Jackson. Because Nick Diaz is so known for his durability, it's almost weird to see him in that state. And he wouldn't lose by TKO again until his very last fight. I come out not even having no clue what I'm looking at. My stance is all whack. I'm doing karate out there. His elbows in and says, pow, cracks me with a jab. I'm like, whoa, what the f is that? I'm on the floor. You know what I mean? I'm back up. Bam, I'm back down. I'm like, And then I'm in the ropes. I'm like kicking the ropes and they stop to fight on me. I'm like, I'm not unconscious, but I'm like, whoa, I'm up. So uh, that was a that was a that was a hard that was a hard that was hard to do it. In 2003, he go on to win the WEC Welterweight Championship against Joe Hurley, with the fight itself being pretty uneventful, with Nick securing a pretty easy Kimura in round one. I think this fight is more famous for the really intense promo playing from Joe Hurley right before the entrances. Like my friends that I party with all died two weeks after my last fight, and that was almost a year ago. And I like don't even go out and party anymore. Nothing like I can't go out and party. I just they're not there. And, I don't do it. All I've been doing is training. Well, I became an alcoholic for about six months, but for the last three months, I quit drinking, smoking, and everything. And God took my friends, and now I'm going to beat on one of his creatures because of it. And uh, I just want to say hi to John and Rob because this fight's for them, and I just want to hit someone so hard that they hear it. And I will. His next two fights would both be rematches against Jeremy Jackson, one in the IFC and one in his UFC debut at UFC 44, memorable for Randy Couture spanking Tito Ortiz. His next fight in the UFC will go on to become his signature performance as he was matched up against Robbie Lawler. Robbie was a KO artist and at the time, Nick was known as just a jiu-jitsu guy, so everyone assumed that his path to victory would be trying to get the fight on the ground. But unbeknownst to everyone, Nick had been spending his time training with Andre Ward at the CYC Boxing Club who was at the time preparing for the 2004 Olympic Games. And because of that, Nick was becoming very confident in his hands. The way he saw it, he trained with the best boxers out there. So if somebody didn't do that, why would they be better at boxing than he was? And in the weird case of foreshadowing, he was interviewed right before the fight with the interviewer calling him, quote, not a KO guy. We're doing a thing on ultimate knockouts here. Um, let's just talk about the art of the KO. I know you're not a KO guy, but you know, I don't know. How do you know that? 
that's what it says. Uh, maybe, that maybe, says. maybe you can prove everyone wrong today and knock Robbie Lawler flat on his face. And that's exactly what ended up happening. Nick Diaz knocked Robbie Lawler out at 1 minute and 31 seconds of round 2 of their fight. But it wasn't just that he knocked him out. It was also that he fearlessly taunted Robbie throughout the fight. The fight is copyrighted material, of course. I can't exactly show you how it went down, but here's Joe Rogan's relatively accurate retelling of the events. Nick took that talking to DEFCON 5, and he got into the <laughs> octagon, and the first thing he does, he gets into the octagon, he looks over at Robbie, he goes, STOCK! Stockton! And he starts walking around, Stockton mother- And Robbie's like, what the f*** is he talking yeah, what about? What does that even mean? Yeah, exactly. And then, the entire time, the fight is going on, like, what? What you gonna do, What you gonna do, And then he hit him, oh, just stung you, and he'd be popping him, and every time and Robbie Lawler didn't talk back to him, but you could clearly see he, was not, he didn't anticipate that. I'd say this fight is the moment where Nick Diaz really came into his own, developing the style and the attitude that he would carry forward with him into the rest of his career. Unfortunately, going forward, Nick wouldn't be as successful going two, four, and six fights between August of 2004 and April of 2006. All four of his losses would be close decisions against Sean Shark, Diego Sanchez, Carl Parisian, and Joe. Riggs. Notably, during the lead up to the Diego fight, Nick would for the first time voice his displeasure publicly about other fighters being promoted or possibly being paid more than he was. Diego got his opportunity to be in the UFC through winning the Ultimate Fighter 1, which by all reports Nick absolutely hated. He gets on a TV show and then he wins one fight and now they're and then now they put him on a main event, you know, on, on Spike TV. I'm like, why do you get that? How come first of all, how can you get the six fit your contract? How can we get paid more than me? Diego even claims that Nick sent him a bunch of nasty emails leading up to their fight in order to throw him off his game, something that Nick himself denies. One of the in MMA journalists at the time, there wasn't many, gave, gave him my email and he was emailing me hate mails, you know, bad like man, talking shit to my mom, talking shit to my dad. So he was taunting like, you over trying email? To get under my skin with everything he had. Wow. You know, like he hated me. He hated the Ultimate Fighters. He was like, any because yeah. we got all that attention. He was in the spotlight at that time. He hated us and he hated me. But of course, the most significant incident during that period came after his fight with Joe Riggs. The two were involved in a brief back and forth after Nick blocked Joe from using the stairs. And that animosity would carry over into the fight, with Nick ending up bleeding profusely from cuts on his face and Joe Riggs breaking both of his hands. But it would be what happened after the fight that would forever become part of MMA lore. A bruised, battered, and dehydrated Joe Riggs and a very unhappy Nick who felt like he should have won the decision were taken to the same hospital. The two quickly crossed paths and began engaging in trash talk that was largely instigated by Nick. I walk into the hospital talking, you know what I mean? Okay. As soon as I walk in the door with my brother, this is strapped to a goddamn gurney, getting his big, wooded ass IV or whatever. I'm like, what the f Why are you strapped to a goddamn gurney? And I walk to my room, he's all, whatever f he's all, I want to go back to the WEC and I was all, f you. I'll still fight your little death. You don't want to fight me right now, you'll get your ass whipped. After being separated and placed in separate rooms, Joe was asked by the medical staff in the hospital to walk to the nurse's station. But in order to do that, he had to pass by Nick's room. And in a very predictable plot twist that the staff should have seen coming from a mile away, Nick attacked Joe and the two began to brawl. And I was like, what the f are you doing over here? You want to get your ass whipped or what? I was off. Just like, I started talking to him, you know, he was talking me too, so, you know, I got up out of my room, and I was like, what then, dude, you got that guy for a while, you hit him, he didn't hit you, you popped him first and dropped him. Yeah, I hit him first, but he was gonna hit me, what do you want me to do? Shut the door, there's a door in the damn room, shut the door. You know, yeah, shut the door on him, right on him, but you know, I ain't no, he walked over to my side of the hospital, though, and I knocked him down, and then he got up and started trying to take me down. They eventually ended up in the medical supply closet with Nate Diaz, who was accompanying his older brother to the hospital, jumping in to beat up Joe as well. But he was like, you know, he was like, get your brother, man, get your brother, man, get your brother, man, please, you know, and I was, you know, he's like, get your brother, he's crazy, you know, I'm like, you. The fight would eventually end up getting broken up by hospital security, with neither fighter ending up in any serious legal trouble, with Nick even claiming that the security were fans of his. But they were, they, they were Nick Diaz fans or whatever, you know, they one of them got an autograph. <laughs> <laughs> one of them got an autograph, I couldn't believe it, yeah, we are in Vegas, you know, so I figured that's the reason why. Oh my gosh. But, you know, they're like, yeah, no, I ain't arresting this guy, it's my favorite fighter. <laughs> now some fans like to cite this incident as proof of what a badass Nick is, but in my opinion, it paints him in a pretty bad light. There's a narrative that's been painted 
about Nick where all of his outbursts are completely reactionary and somewhat morally justified. People do something to him so he does something to them back but he never messes with anyone for no reason. But in this specific incident you can clearly tell that he was both the aggressor and the cause. And not only that, he sucker punched Joe and ended up jumping him with Nate while he was in a very compromised position. And years later, Joe would reveal that while he was being jumped, he ended up losing control of his bowels. So put yourself in his shoes. He signs up for a fight and his opponent decides to create a situation out of nowhere by refusing to move out of his way. He proceeds to pull out a grueling decision where he breaks both of his hands and then proceeds to get jumped by that same opponent and his brother in the hospital when he's at his most vulnerable. To the point where he craps his pants. No matter which way you slice it, Nick was in the wrong here and I think it's important to acknowledge that because fan bases have this tendency to romanticize fighters to the point where every action that they take seems to be justified. And that's just not the way that life works. All humans are flawed and Nick did a real shitty thing, uh, no pun intended. After the fight with Riggs, Nick would end up going on a three fight winning streak before leaving the UFC at the end of 2006. His first fight out of the UFC would be fought at lightweight against Takanori Gomi at Pride 33 held in Las Vegas. Gomi at the time was the Pride lightweight champion and was looked at as one of the best lightweights on the planet along with BJ Penn. Incredibly hard hitting with solid wrestling, he was nicknamed the Fireball Kid and held the record for longest winning streak in Pride history spanning 10 fights from 2004 to 2006. Nick was a sizable underdog going into the fight, but after surviving an early knockdown, he was able to lock in a rarely seen Gogo Plata and finish Gomi by submission in round two. If the first Robbie Lawler fight marked Nick entering his own, this fight, in my opinion, signaled him entering his prime. He was able to beautifully tie his skill set together and create the kind of fast paced pressure inside of the ring that he would later on become famous for. Going into round two, Gomi was visibly tired, unable to raise his hands, and even asked the referee to take a look at Nick's cut in hopes of getting the fight stopped. Unfortunately, this fight would also be the first time that Nick would clash with the Nevada State Athletic Commission when he tested positive for marijuana metabolites and the fight was overturned to a no contest. In the next year, Nick would fight five times, going 4-1 and one with his only loss coming by Dr. Stoppage to Hawaii native KJ Nunes. The stoppage resulted from cuts opening up over both of his eyes in round one, a loss that he naturally did not accept. He would end the year with a fight against Thomas Danny in his hometown of Stockton, California, where he would end up brutalizing Danny before finishing him in round two, all the while taunting him throughout the fight. Danny represented everything that Nick hated about mixed martial arts at the time, guys that would dye their hair funny colors and adjust their personality to seem a lot more extroverted than they actually were in order to market themselves. He's a really big hype guy, you know, he does a lot of extra paint in his hair and a lot of, um, you know, he makes it in every magazine like I was just saying in the press conference about how I'm not in magazines and he is and um you know, uh, that's that's on account of him hyping things. He treated him so poorly throughout the fight that he ended up having a moment of clarity and feeling bad and sending him a direct message apologizing for his conduct. That's one thing I really regret too is I never got a chance to, uh, you know, I grew up a little mature a little bit. And you, I wanted to, uh, you know, I want to apologize to that guy, you know, Thomas, uh, Thomas Denny, you know? Yeah. Here I am, I beat him up in front of his family and, and you know, I gave him all sorts of cues and like all sorts of I don't give a f and uh, it's just, you know, I, I, you know, I feel bad about that now. You know, and I, I, if I can see him just face, you know, I even wrote him a direct message one time. I never got a response. But, uh, you know, I'd like to apologize. I don't know if he's listened to this or if he does. I apologize for, you know, uh, you know, I understand now. He had to build his, you know, he's trying to build a, a big fight. I don't think it was worth it. I don't, you know, uh, really, because I doubt he was getting paid that much. And none of us were back then. The following year, he would make a strike for his debut by retiring Frank Shamrock. The lead up to the fight had a lot of back and forth trash talk, but ultimately the two ended up on good terms, showing each other mutual respect when it was all said and done. This signified a passing of the torch as Frank, as great as he was, was the best of the old guard with a somewhat outdated fighting style and Nick was a completely new breed of fighter. During this time, Nick's only concern was training and winning fights. He didn't drink, he didn't party, and by his own admission, he absolutely hated the city of Las Vegas. Vegas is a theme, dude, and that doesn't fool me. Every fighter I know wants to move there and wants to live there. It, I love it because they're that dumb. I'm like, I can't wait to fight them. They're so stupid. They, they, you know, they thrive off these big fake titty mutant chicks. Disgusting. Every last one of them. They're all trying to, to do something to get somewhere. If I were there, I'd be there to meet some people, you know, like some endorsement deals, some things or, or, or whatnot. These, these people, they end up wanting to live there and move there. All they do is go out and drink 
and they can't, they all drink. They all, you know, even the ones that, like, even the athletes there that don't drink, the other ones force them into drinking, and they don't go out and stand around and drink water like I do. I hate it there, honestly. Unfortunately, Nick always had a hard time fully monetizing his success. Some of it was due to the fact that he never quite figured out how to have a strong management team behind him, and some of it was due to his own personal quirks as a person. Like, in this hilarious story of him trying to secure a sponsorship. Right before we walk in, I said, Nick, you know, whatever they try to get you to, to endorse or anything like that, I said, just fake it until you make it. If they want you to sell snowballs to an Eskimo, you tell them you can do it. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I got it for sure. <clears throat> so we go and sit down in the meeting. Uh, you know, the guys are, the guys come in, they're gentlemen, they're nice, they shake Nick's hand, you know, they're like, hey, how's it going? And we sit down and they start telling me about this new product they're coming out with, which is like this kind of training dummy uh, thing that's used for mitt works and they're going on and on about how excited they are and in detail about it and and uh you know after they're done giving their spiel I, I turn to nick and i look at him you know thinking to myself all right nick there's your chance to sell yourself you know and i go hey nick you know well, what do you think about you know demoing this product and, and showing the world you know how to use this and nick looks looks at me he looks at the guys he leans back in his chair, he looks down at this table, he says, and then he looks up at us and he says, honestly, that's the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> he's like, he's like my, jaw, my jaw dropped to the floor. And I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, this isn't happening right now. Like, I'm, I must be dreaming. This has got to be a nightmare. And it goes, he's like, actually, that thing is so stupid that... You might be able to sell it just because I hate it so much and people hate me so much. Oh and I'm thinking to myself, God. dude, what is going on here? Like, this is like, and you should have, you guys should have seen the look uh. on the sponsors' faces. They were in shock. Even though Nick never could quite give right when it came to financial management, the team that he trained with around this time as Caesar Gracie Jiu Jitsu was at its absolute peak. He had his brother, Gilbert Melendez, Jake Shields, and he would periodically train his boxing with Andre Ward. And all of these people were at their absolute primes. He even picked up a physical therapist in Jose Garcia. Remember that name. In 2010, he became the Strike Force Walter Way champion. And that same year, he would rematch KJ Noons, outboxing for all five rounds. This victory was cathartic because not only did he get to avenge a loss that he felt like wasn't a loss, he also did it in a way where he proved to be better than KJ Noons at what he was considered to be a specialist in, boxing. He was also involved in the brawl with Jason Mayhem Miller after Mayhem entered the cage to ask his teammate Jake Shields for a rematch after a hard-fought victory against Dan Henderson. This created a situation of Mayhem throwing shots at Nick in every media appearance and interview that he could in attempts to secure a fight. Don't be scared, homie. Now, is this your way of campaigning for a fight against Nick Diaz sometime well, in the future? I just want to let it be known that, dude, I'm not scared. I'm ready to go. Like, I'm ready to go anytime. Let's do it. Let's make it happen. But obviously, for some reason, I, the fight's not happening. I don't have a contract in front of me, and everybody wants to see the fight. I'm ready to do the fight. Everybody wants to see the fight. Everyone's like, hey, man, we're going to whip Nick Diaz's ass. I hear that like 10 times a day, you know, and that's just at my dinner table, you know. But it's just like uh, one of those things, like, I'm in the middle of this weird publicity war where, you know, people think that I, I don't I don't want the fight. I want the fight. Hell yeah, I want the fight. Of course I want the fight because I will whip his ass and, you know, I, and, and make him look bad doing it. And Nick would make a video response of his own questioning why a middleweight would want to challenge a welterweight while ridiculing Mayhem's hair and personality, further solidifying the fact that he hated MMA fighters that marketed themselves in that way. Just thinking about your little interview I just watched. Um, this morning before I left my house, and, uh, I just want to tell you, you, double, you, all right? Um, you came running like a bat out of hell, so you got your fucking ass whooped. That's what you get, you stupid. You paint your hair, you got that stripe down the middle of your forehead, uh, you know, right down the middle of your hair. Uh, what is that? You know what I mean? You have a, you have a character. Like you have to walk around and be that every day. That's too bad for you, man. You got gold teeth and funny hair. The f is that? I don't know why you want to live your life like that, man. Why are you trying to pick on the little guy, anyways? I'm smaller than you are. You know? 
get your ass beat by everybody and then you want to try to fight me because I'm in a good position. Why are you trying to hate? Ultimately, nothing came of this as Mayhem went on to host Bully Beatdown and Nick's main objective around this time was hunting down welterweight king George St. Pierre in the UFC. I don't know, George. What do you say? You know, I'm saying... You know, if I was him, I'd stand up and say something. I'd be like, hey, you know, let's, let's, you know, make this happen or whatever, you know? Regardless, like, I'm the, you know, he's not talking like he wants to fight me, but I'm the only guy that's, that's you know, people are talking about for that fight. And so it's just like, every act's like that's like not even a possibility or something. I think that's ridiculous. I think it's not a possibility because, you know, uh, this guy doesn't want to stand up and fight me. He'll say, well, fight me. I say, hey, look, you know, I want to fight anybody I can that's, that that people are, are talking good about, you know? I don't care if it's even a heavier weight. If this guy stands up in the middle of the cage after he wins a fight and says, hey, I want to fight Nick Diaz, I'll hop the cage and I'll get up in this face and I'll say, what's up? Let's do this, you know what I'm saying? But if I said something like that, I don't think I don't, I don't, I don't think he'd get up out of seat. You know, I think he'd just sit there. I have to highlight a bit of Nick's marketing acumen here. He claims that George St. Pierre should want to fight somebody on site if they call him out. And yet, at the same time, Mayhem is calling him out and he's actively trying not to fight him in order to secure this fight. That shows that there was always a lot more substance and method to Nick's madness than people ever gave him credit for. He wasn't just talking trash for no reason and sometimes he didn't even mean it. He was simply looking to trigger an emotional response from fighters and fans in order to secure high profile fights that would get him paid. And with George St. Pierre, he would get his wish after his last fight in Strike Force against Paul Daly. The fight itself was an absolutely insane back and forth affair with both fighters getting hurt at different points, but eventually Nick drowning Daly with pressure and coming out on top. The UFC brass Lorenzo Fertitta and Dana White were in attendance and absolutely loved what they saw and ended up offering Nick a contract back stage. Nick vacated his strike force welterweight belt and signed on to fight George St. Pierre at UFC 137. And on the surface, it seemed like Nick had finally gotten everything that he wanted, a high profile fight against the number one welterweight on the planet that came with a big payday. But unfortunately, there's just something about the UFC and the media obligations that it places upon his fighters that just doesn't mesh well with Nick and his personality. He missed two press conferences leading up to the fight, seemingly disappearing off the face of the planet. In a pretty surreal moment, when Caesar Gracie called Dana White in the middle of the press conference that Nick was missing to let him know that he was looking for him but couldn't find him. Hey Caesar. <laughs> All right, no, that's cool. Let's let's. I, I'm gonna call you around 3:30. Let's talk. All right, bye. He said, "I apologize and I agree with you 100% in what you're doing, and we're embarrassed, and and I don't even know what to say. I haven't slept much." I've been trying to chase Nick Diaz all around town. Nobody can find him. He's hiding from everybody. So he thinks it's as weird as we all do. And Georgia, uh, what, what? Maybe, yeah, maybe he's going to show up right now and, hey, it's a prank. I'm coming. <laughs> Are you, are you trying to prank me? Is that, is, is that a TV? No, no. Yeah. In response to this, the UFC ended up scrapping the fight completely and matched up George St. Pierre with Carlos Condit instead. And Nick was matched up with BJ Penn, a fight that he really didn't want. And it's important to note that BJ Penn claims that Caesar Gracie played games with him, Dana White, and Nick in order to make the fight happen. Dana called us and said, you know, Caesar, Caesar just called me and said they would love that, that they would love to fight Nick Diaz. I mean, that, 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 uh, that him and Nick Diaz would love to fight you, and that's the fight they want. So I texted Caesar. I said, Dana just said that you would love to fight us, uh, and this and that, and that's the fight you want. And then I guess, I don't know, maybe Caesar didn't want to say that he said that. He texted me back and he said, laugh out loud, Dana just told us the same thing. So I ended up thinking, you know, Dana's trying to set me up and get me into a personal thing, but it's really Caesar. Caesar was hoodwinked me, I guess. I don't know, whatever you want to call it. And I kind of ended up getting it to a Dana, and then I kind of thought the UFC was setting me up to build a personal thing, you know, but I ended up talking to Dana later, and, and Dana was like, yeah, I told you, I didn't say that. You know, Caesar did say that he would love to fight you, and that's how the whole fight got put together, so 
I don't know what that was all about. Now, while Nick wasn't yet the one expressing dissatisfaction, it's probably safe to assume that he wasn't exactly thrilled about business being done that way to get him a fight that he didn't even want. The fight itself ended up being competitive early, with Nick eventually picking up the pace and drowning BJ Penn with pressure to earn a pretty clear unanimous decision. Now, the fight with George St. Pierre and Carlos Condit ended up falling through as George suffered an ACL injury and was forced to withdraw. So as he was enjoying the show in the crowd as a spectator, Nick got on the microphone in the post-fight interview and told everyone that he doesn't think that George is hurt at all, but is in fact scared to fight. He also uttered this famous line, which to this day is used as part of the intro to the Joe Rogan podcast, which doesn't really have much to do with anything. It's just kind of cool. Train by day, Joe Rogan podcast by night. All day. George took this call out very personally and began to immediately and in a very out of character way aggressively request a fight against Nick Diaz. I've known George St. Pierre since 2004. He's one of the nicest guys I've ever met and he's always, you know, exactly the same no matter what the situation is, no matter who he's fighting. Since 2004, I've never seen him like he was tonight. George St. Pierre flipped out tonight after Nick Diaz was in the ring. He said that Nick, I quote, you're gonna think I'm full of but this is the truth. I, I quote, he's the most disrespectful human being I've ever met, and I'm going to put the worst beating you've ever seen on him in the UFC, is what George St. Pierre said. But since he was still out with injury, Nick was matched up with Carlos Condit in his place instead for the interim welterweight title. The UFC promoted the hell out of this fight with a three-episode miniseries called Primetime that covered the backstory and the training camp for each fighter. I also want to note the UFC was doing some weird shady stuff stuff in the name of promotion leading up to this fight as well. Mainly making it seem like Nick was saying things that he didn't say or straight up dubbing his voice to make him say things that he didn't say. People are making me say and say, you know, like they took my voice and put, I'm going to come out on top. Like it's two, it's me talking two different times and they, and they slapped it in there. What did they do to you? What was that? What did they say when they did that to you? I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna knock him out, tap him out, but it was actually, I'm gonna knock him out, tap him out. It wasn't like, you know, I'm gonna knock him out or tap him out. It was like, you know, they chopped it and they, they made him say what they wanted him to say. And they did that to me too. And that's really big. That's all people hear is me talking <laughs> like, oh, I'm gonna come out on top. Like I'm overly confident or, you know, I'm talking that confidence or whatever and i'm like if i'm gonna do that i'm gonna do that you don't need to make me do that you know on the primetime show there's a moment where nick yells where you at carlos to the camera where you at carlos and he never said that he repeatedly said where you at george so they had to take that sentence take out george and i guess put carlos in there from a different interview that he did to make this frankenstein sentence to make it seem like he was actively calling carlos condit out and that's uh, i don't know is that bad uh, it's not good it's definitely weird outside of that nick did pretend participate in several press conferences and give several interviews to the media in the lead up, but generally gave everyone the impression that he didn't want to be there. But here's the thing, the less effort he put in, the more people wanted to see and hear from him. So by acting like he didn't want to promote the fight at all, he was actually doing an excellent job promoting it. And that's always been the thing with Nick. The more anti-establishment he acted, the more he became an enigma to the media and the fans, thereby generating insane interest as a result. And whether it was intentional or unintentional or a mix of both, it was brilliant and it worked like a charm every single time. Unfortunately, the fight did not go as well as the promotion for Nick and he ended up losing a unanimous decision. He immediately voiced his displeasure with the result, feeling like he was the aggressor throughout the fight and Carlos simply took advantage of the rules in ways that scored him points but didn't actually do any damage. And my personal opinion on this is split. I feel like Nick does have a pretty strong point here because Carlos Conde did try to avoid the fight, so to speak, by being very defensive and not taking any real risk for all five rounds. But at the same time, I can't exactly blame somebody for not wanting to play into their opponent's strengths. Everybody knows that trying to go toe-to-toe -to -toe in the middle of the octagon and trying to outfight and out-cardio Nick Diaz is kind of a dumb move because durability and endurance is what he's known for. So if you're able to avoid that and exploit holes in a skill set that get you the victory, well, then you just have a good game plan. Nobody ragged on Stipe Miocic for exploiting Francis Ngannou's lack of wrestling in their first fight, you know what I mean? But it's also undeniable that one of the things that Nick does best, just like his brother Nate, is lose officially, but walk away with the bigger moral victory. And that's exactly what happened here. Condon may have gotten the official victory on the score.
scorecards, but all anybody remembers from that fight is Nick slapping him around the octagon and talking trash to him. So in reality, the public perception that Conda had at the time of being an unstoppable KO machine was damaged irreparably, while the public perception of Nick Diaz stayed exactly the same as it always was. So in reality, the loss itself wasn't that bad, but what was bad was that he had once again tested positive for marijuana metabolites with the Nevada State Athletic Commission. And this test came with a heavier punishment, with Nick being suspended for a year and losing 30% of his purse. But while he was unable to compete, George St. Pierre would go on to fight Carlos Condit in a very grueling back and forth match where he was almost finished with a head kick. And since by comparison, Nick was never in any real danger against Carlos Condit, this once again reignited interest in a matchup between him and George St. Pierre. The two signed on to meet at UFC 158 in March of 2013 in George St. Pierre's hometown of Montreal, Quebec, Canada. The lead up would be defined with Nick taking real issue with GSP having real life disdain for him with George in turn saying that his words were simply misrepresented to promote the fight. How many how many times you uh, had a gun to your head, George? How many times how many of your best friends been shot through the chest with a 45? Or how many of your best friends been stomped, put to sleep in a, into a coma? And you know, how many kids put gum in your hair growing up? Like, should I go further back? I hate everybody pulling the bully card, all bullies, I hate bullies. You know, um, he, I don't I doubt he was ever a hopeless person. I don't want anybody to see anybody hurt. I don't believe anybody out here, um, you know, working towards greatness deserves to be uh, deserves to be beat down and smashed in. You told the fans that I deserve to get beat down, and you told the fans that that I chase you around, or you told the you fans. You told the fan I was scared of you and avoiding you. And yeah, everything. I got the fight too, right? You can understand Absolutely. that. I'm working towards something here. All right, everybody knows that. They're selling you all wolf tickets, people. You're eating them right up. George here is selling you wolf tickets. Dana here, he's selling you wolf tickets. The UFC is selling you some wolf tickets. I'm of course, not, we're gonna I'm, have I'm, I'm not mad at you, Nick. I don't, I don't wish you a bad life. All right, well, I, I, I understand I'm, you got to pump the fight, and you know. I didn't say didn't nothing think, bad. Things, things, you didn't, go well. things, things didn't go well for you. They took okay. some line that I answered a question maybe three years ago. They put no, it, it wasn't, in the bro. That was not three years ago. Dude. Yeah, that that I don't, ago, I don't remember. I, I don't know three. the dark Everybody place stuff. I don't remember this. They are probably talking about me because I tried to be a nice guy. And people said something bad about me. I'm like, yeah, people, I'm dark in my head. Sometimes when people uh, insult me, I'm getting angry in my head. Yeah. Nick also took issue with the UFC not promoting him in the way that he wanted, specifically being unhappy with the look of the fight poster. I mean, can I get? One, you know, uh, buttered up Photoshop picture in a magazine or in, uh, uh, you know what I mean? On, on, on a poster, I've been on, I've had plenty of ugly posters. I know they could, you know, they could do better than that, but they're not, they're not worried about it. So, and if you're confused by that, considering that all posters are photoshopped in this behind the scenes clip, he explains exactly what he meant to a UFC official. Uh, but they know what I mean. By making me look nice yes. and attractive yep. or intimidating yep. or attractive yep. instead of like a sometimes kind of scrub or but put me a picture of my lips like this book. So Nick was upset that they made him look ugly, and I'm not gonna lie, looking at that poster, they did kinda do him dirty on that pick. Nick would go on to lose a unanimous decision once again in a fight that honestly wasn't very competitive, a very classic George St. Pierre performance where you would take him down and control him over and over again. What this fight was definitely not is the horrific beating that George St. Pierre promised to inflict upon Nick, making Nick's claim that the UFC and George were selling everybody wolf tickets all the more potent. The post-fight press conference was interesting with Nick putting some of the blame on his team and implying that Caesar Gracie wasn't doing his job the way that he was supposed to. I felt like everybody knew I had it coming, like Caesar knew I had it coming, everybody knew I had it coming. And then as soon as I had it coming, nobody wanted, to, nobody was around to help me. Um, you know, the only ones that came to help me was, was uh, my Sambo coach, Gil Castillo. And, you know, I can't, you know, Jake and Gil, they're off, they're on their, they, they can't, they can't train hard right now. They got, they have fights coming up, you know, they've got stuff going on. And they need to have their downtime when it's downtime. I can't go roughing those guys up uh, just because I need training. He would also roast Johnny Hendricks right to his face while sitting next to him. I, I watched some of the fight with Carlos here. I thought he did a great job versus, versus Johnny here. You know, I hate I hate that he lost. I hate it. I hate it that he lost. You know, because I don't think he, I don't think, no offense, I don't think he lost though. I, I just think that the way that the sport is geared towards a wrestler, you know, going on top every round. And, uh, you know, what I found really interesting is this piece right here. I might as well just be a kid. You know, I've had fight after fight after fight after fight. You don't know what that does to somebody that didn't graduate high school. You don't understand. Okay, so you have, everybody has to take that. I mean, well, nobody has to do shit. 
but you can take it into consideration for a second. Think about what three fights a year will do to you your whole life. This is a moment of real vulnerability for Nick, and it explains a lot about why he's had so much trouble in his career with everything except for the actual act of fighting. He's basically telling you that because he got started in this life so young, he never had a coming of age period where he was able to figure out regular adult things like time management and financial responsibility. Therefore, he constantly feels like a fish out of water. And when you frame it like that, the missing commitments, the dissatisfaction with the pay and the promotion and the management, and the lashing out begins to make a lot more sense. He rose to the top of the sport through sheer hard work and talent, but didn't have a solid base of regular everyday skills to help him deal with the business end of it, and didn't really even know where to look for people that would help him. So he settled for the first person that offered to take that burden off of his shoulders, Caesar Gracie. And whether that was a good decision or a bad one really depends on who you ask, and I'll get into that later on in the video. In 2012, Nick made a change in his life. Up until he was 29 years old, he was exclusively a weed smoker. He didn't really drink or party, and as we went over earlier, he had somewhat of a disdain for that lifestyle. But that would all change when Ronda Rousey would visit him in Stockton to train with him and his team. According to Nick, she got him to start drinking. So I didn't drink until I met Ronda. <laughs> Ronda Rousey came to my house and she was like, you need to loosen up. Right. She was like, she put a bottle of tequila in front of me, boom, slid it over on the table. She's like, time for you to have a shot. I'm like, oh, all right. All right, I'll get drunk with you. So, she's a uh, bad influence. Oh, yeah, no, she's great. I mean, who the f*** doesn't drink in, in her 20s? Like, come on. And after the GSP fight, we would get our first indication that Nick may be loosening up a little bit too much when he would catch a DUI charge in late 2013, and he would get another one the following year in 2014. He would end up getting a plea deal for two days in jail with credit for one day served in the initial arrest. He would also be tasked with completing a DUI educational course and be placed on three years of informal probation, meaning he didn't have to report to a parole officer, but simply had to stay out of trouble. He may have made out pretty good when it came to punishment, but these may have been the early warning signs for what many, including myself, speculate is a full-blown issue with alcohol that would appear down the line. In 2015, Nick would come out of retirement for a super fight against Anderson Silva at UFC 183, making his middleweight debut and unfortunately pretty much ending his career. The fight itself was very entertaining, with Nick trying to give the fans exactly what they wanted to see and attempting to engage Silva on the feet and even taunting him when he felt like Silva wasn't pressing the action enough. Showing no fear towards the guy that was considered to be the boogeyman at 185 pounds for almost a decade, showing once again that Nick Diaz is one of the baddest dudes ever to step foot in the octagon or ring. But just like a lot of his fights in the UFC, ultimately he looked good in defeat with Silva pulling away with a unanimous decision victory. And in the case of Deja Vu, Nick was very unhappy with the decision and felt like he won, but it didn't end up mattering either way because both participants ended up testing positive soon after. Nick, as always, for marijuana metabolites, and Silva for actual steroids, drostanolone and androsterone. Silva would argue that the positive result came from a tainted sexual performance supplement, and would end up being fined 30% of his purse, as well as his win bonus totaling in $380,000 and suspended for a year retroactive to his fight. But Nick, shockingly, would receive a much harsher sentence, being suspended for five years and fined a $165,000. I mean, how are you feeling right now? I'm, t I'm, I'm pretty pissed off, you know what I mean? This commission and everybody, uh, they've done everything they can to keep me from being all the way on top where I should be. You know, they got me in here sweating bullets in a, in a, in a, in a freaking courtroom. Like my, 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 uh, what, my lawyers got me over to sweat because they all thinking I'm gonna flip out and do something really, you know, really nuts like I was, you know, about this close to doing. This is the type of sort of reason why I'm, that people don't understand that I'm the best fighter in the world. They don't understand that. These guys are, are, are legally trying to rob me, robbing other fighters. Like, I became a fighter, so I don't gotta rob nobody. You know what I mean? This is, this is, uh, so that, that's just how I feel. And this event would rob Nick of the rest of his prime years and pretty much put an end to his career, at least as a legit competitor. But it didn't quite go down the way a lot of people think. Nick would appeal the decision four months later and the suspension and fine would be reduced to 18 months and $100,000. The suspension was officially lifted on August 1st of 2016, but Nick would still not pay his fees, which is why he wasn't able to corner his brother Nate Diaz in his fights against Conor McGregor at UFC 196 
and UFC 202. The night before Nate's rematch against Conor McGregor, Nick would post a series of Snapchats of himself visibly inebriated after partying all night, arguing with a USADA representative who wanted to test him. Uh, in about five or six hours. And seeing this type of behavior from Nick was becoming a lot more commonplace. The guy that was once strongly against alcohol use was now seen partying a lot more than he was seen training. Basically what I'm trying to say is that the NSAC decision did end up ruining the latter portion of Nick's career, but it ruined it by triggering a series of events that let him down a lifestyle that was not conducive to being a fighter. And not because he was forced to set out the full five years like a lot of people want to believe. And I feel like this statement will get some people in their feelings because for some reason so many don't want to believe that Nick Diaz was at least partially responsible for the downslide of his own career. Yes, he was treated extremely unfairly. Yes, he was made an example out of. But the only reason that he didn't compete in the years of 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2020 is because he chose not to. And you can get mad about it. You can do mental gymnastics and romanticize what he was doing as some ultimate act of bravery and heroic rebellion. But at the end of the day, it's just a fact. In May 2018, he was arrested for what was described as three separate charges of domestic battery with grave bodily injury due to strangulation. The accuser, an unnamed woman who had claimed to have previously been in a relationship with Nick, said that the two got into an argument over Nick sleeping with one of her friends with him becoming physically violent towards her, something that she attributed to his quote, recent cocaine use. It was also stated in several articles that Nick was combative during the arrest. Nick himself would claim that he was completely innocent, going as far as saying that he was framed. People, we've been dying to hear from you because, like, ever since the whole arrest thing, like, we were wondering what your message was to the fans, you know what I'm saying? Frank. <laughs> <laughs> And in a now deleted Instagram post, Nick's close friend Matt Stout, aka Mighty Matt, would claim that this was a stalker of Nick's that was harassing him for over two years and would call him over 1,000 times a day and was completely mentally deranged. Now I tried to figure out who this person could potentially be and after combing through hundreds of comments online, people seem to be pointing their finger at either one of two people. The first is a woman who claimed to have married Nick back in 2017 and after receiving some backlash, she ended up releasing a video on her YouTube channel that is now unlisted, meaning you need a direct link to see it, where she expounds on the situation, claiming that it was all a misunderstanding on her part due to her being naive because of her age and her Christian faith. She would also deny having any involvement in the 2018 accusations on the Twitter exchange. The other person is somebody with hundreds of thousands of Instagram followers that people say has been obsessed with Nick and she does seem to have a lot of fan art. For what it's worth, I have seen a set in comments that Nick had blocked her Instagram profile, but I have no way of verifying that. The case would eventually be dismissed with prejudice, meaning the charges can be refiled at a later date and Judge Amy Cellini would be quoted as saying, The frustrating thing for me is we have a lot of true victims out there. When you see stuff like this and you take strained resources from the true victims and it's frustrating for the court. And Nick's defense attorney, Ross Goodman, would say, I think ultimately they knew that it was going to be a fiasco for them and I was going to finally get to cross-examine the alleged victim and all the different versions of the events would have become clear. 
clear. The fact that she didn't sustain any injuries that supported the charges would have become evident and I had texts from her shortly thereafter to other people showing that she just wanted to have a meeting with Nick and that she wasn't injured and she was in control of the case. It was clear that she was motivated for other reasons which is consistent with all the other inconsistencies and contradictions. I think she was just going to be exposed and they wanted to avoid that. The police would also release the body cam footage showing a clearly inebriated and shocked but very cooperative Nick, totally contradicting the combative claim. Why don't you read my messages on my scoot, phone? Scoot, scoot them under no, your ass. I really can't. It was really hard to get them back. Well, that's why you freaking shouldn't have done it. I shouldn't have done it. Keep your foot in. You're right, right but I, didn't, I thought you guys were going to let me go in like five seconds. I didn't do anything. Okay, scoot up. Get them under your ass. No, 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 no. I can't. I really can't. Okay, well then fine. No, keep your foot down. Then. We'll just go this way. All right. Hold on. Copy. I don't mind my demon. You guys don't understand, dude. What what is what is the what is the charge? What is the and there's also this portion of the video where the arresting officer is seen getting reprimanded by another officer that is implied to be higher in rank that just straight up doesn't sit right with me. Check the camera. Listen to me real quick. I need you to take control of your suspects. Spring Valley. Okay. If they're talking shit, if you need to freaking take them to jail, you need to hobble them, you need to whoop their ass, you whoop their ass, you hear me? Yes, I need you to hold and take them, all right? Make those decisions for me. I should not be making them for you, okay? Yes, sir. All right. Let's Good talk. The next year, Nick would reappear in the public eye in a bizarre interview with Ariel Hawani where, again, he was clearly drunk. That's not what I meant. I meant okay. that. Uh, and that means, every, that, that's all, that means everything to me, so that's what you meant and that's what I meant. Like that, of course, that means everything. He would finally make his long-awaited return to the octagon at UFC 266 in 2021 against the guy that put him on the map originally, Robbie Lawler. There was a couple of hiccups leading up to the fight, mainly Nick requesting a weight change from the originally agreed upon 170 pound limit to 185 and just generally seeming very lethargic and unhappy during the media appearances and lead up to the fight, even going as far as to claim that whoever set this fight up was an idiot. The fight itself was a fun back and forth affair with Nick Nick looking noticeably slower and more out of shape than his last appearance on the octagon and uncharacteristically quitting in round three when he suffered a busted nose. I think it's kind of interesting that a fight against Robbie Lawler signaled both the entrance and the exit of Nick Diaz as a legit competitor in the world of MMA. Now remember when I told you to remember the name Jose Garcia? Well, now's the time to talk about it. On his Instagram, Jose would claim that Nick was financially compromised living with his girlfriend at Caesar Gracie's house who was taking advantage of him leading up to a Robbie Lawler fight. He repeatedly called Caesar a snake and the Don King of MMA while claiming that he was blocking him from giving Nick the much needed post-workout recovery physical therapy that he always did. He even claimed that a confrontation ensued with him being taken to the hospital with a heart-related medical emergency. He would also release a series of text messages of him going back and forth with Caesar and insulting one another as well as him talking to Nate Diaz with Nate apparently trying to coordinate with him to come out and help Nick. Caesar would also send him a video of Nick holding papers which were implied to be his contract and telling him that Caesar was his manager. Jose and the people in his comments would also refer to Nick's manager Kevin Mubenga as quote a Nigerian scammer and in this comment he claims that collectively him and Caesar had Nick sign a contract where they take 40% of his pay. So I reached out to a couple of people on Instagram that seem to be close to Nick from pictures and videos in hopes of getting some behind the scenes info on what's been going on. Considering that I'm not a credentialed journalist of any sort and I have absolutely no connections in the world of MMA and boxing, I wasn't exactly expecting an answer, but I did in fact end up getting some information. Now the people I spoke to asked to remain anonymous and I have absolutely no way of corroborating this information so you're just gonna have to treat it as hearsay and draw your own conclusions. I'm not here to slander anybody, this is simply what I heard, it's a rumor. And the rumor is that Nick has somewhat of an issue with partying, he's in a relatively tough financial situation and he has several people around him that act like his manager even though they are not qualified to be managers. Nick has a very good heart, he tries to take care of several people in his closest circles but those same people oftentimes end up taking advantage of him. Unfortunately, and this part might not be that surprising, Nick also has a tendency to commit to things and then not do them, thereby unintentionally burning people. That includes businesses, appearances, sponsorships, deals, and so forth. A lot of people are pining for his attention 24-7 and he's being pulled several different directions at once and some around him are legitimately concerned. I have no comment on what's going on with Caesar Gracie. I haven't been able to find anything about him publicly past what's been 
posted on Jose Garcia's page and what Nick has said in the media. So I'll just leave it at that. But I do have some questions regarding Kevin Mubanga. On his website, he claims to have previously worked with rapper French Montana, but I can't find what he actually did with him outside of taking a couple of pictures. His site also states that in addition to Nick, he also manages Nate Diaz. But when you go on Google, Nate's manager is stated over and over again as being Zach Rosenfield. So in what capacity does Kevin Mubanga manage him? He also claims to manage boxer Jojo Diaz, but again, outside of a couple of pictures together, I can't find his name tied to Jojo Diaz in any way, shape, or form. Same with boxer Tristan Calcruz. Same with Kamaru Usman's brother, Mo Usman. In fact, the only client that his name seems tied to publicly is Nick Diaz. And of course, I'm not accusing him of lying about having clients that he doesn't have. I couldn't possibly know that, but why isn't his name tied to them outside of his website and his Instagram? These are just some questions that I have. I'm allowed to ask questions, right? And that's about all from me. If you made it this far, you're definitely a real one. This is by far the longest and most labor intensive video that I've ever done. So I really hope that you enjoyed watching it. For any questions or suggestions, you can reach out to me by email at gk2425 at gmail.com or through Instagram at greg underscore k3. And before I let you go, please remember this. Giraffes are 30 times more likely to get hit by lightning than people.